we embark on the journey of Holy Week, we may not be able to or choose to participate in all the liturgies that we have, whether in person or via Zoom. But every day during this week is an opportunity and an invitation to us to once again think about what the Lord had decided to do in order to save this humanity of ours. How God was willing, as we heard in the reading from the letter to the Philippians, how Jesus in his humanity and his divinity was willing to empty himself for us. Empty himself of his divinity, let go of the gift of life that is the most precious possession that we have in order to make it possible for you and me to fully recover that relationship with God that had been lost in the sin of Adam and Eve. At Christmas, we celebrate the beginning of that reconciliation. But it isn't until we come to this holy this reminder today, the reading of the Passion, and what we celebrate in particular on Good Friday, and what in anticipation we come to with the celebration of the resurrection of the Lord. It isn't until we get through that part of the mystery and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that the whole thing comes together. And it's a reminder to you and me that there will be never enough time to ponder, to reflect on, to pray about what the love of God for you and me collectively, for all humanity, as well as for each of us individually, ultimately means. Because we can't fully understand nor imagine a love so great, so deep, so faithful, so willing to do what Jesus did for me, for you, for us all, for all humanity, for all times. That's why we have to continue to celebrate these holy days. That's why the church has to continue to preach the gospel to all creation. That's why where the church has become weak, it needs to continue to proclaim this message to recover those who have drifted away so that they can become alive again in this life that God wants us to have. I share this reflection with you from the Word Among Us. They began to salute him with hail, King of the Jews. What comes to mind when you hear the word royalty? Perhaps you picture medieval kings and queens sitting on great thrones, or you might think of the glamour of today's royal families. But what about Jesus? As son of David, he came from a royal line of earthly kings and rulers. As son of God, he is king of the universe. But look how he's treated. He's denounced by the crowd, even though Pilate calls him a king. He is mocked by the soldiers who pretend to give him homage. And he is taunted by those who think that a real king would come down from the cross and save himself. But this is exactly what royalty in the kingdom of God looks like. A king who empties himself and takes the form of a slave. A king who rides into Jerusalem not on a chariot, but on a donkey. A king who willingly submits to spitting, lashing, and a brutal death to save his people. As we go through Holy Week, 
Keep Jesus' kingship in mind. Today he sits at the right hand of the Father reigning in glory. But he is also the servant king who loved you enough and me enough to die for us and who still loves us enough to forgive every sin. This is God's way of royalty. It's our way as well because through Jesus' death and resurrection we have become grafted into the family of God. We have royal blood running through our veins. Through the grace that Jesus won for us, we can live out this royal calling as he did, in love, in service, and in laying down our life for his people. As we walk this road, know that a crown of righteousness awaits us, and all who serve in Jesus' royal household. Jesus, you are my king, our king. May we serve you every day of our life. <clears throat> and then, one other thing that I thought would be important to hear today. From this homily service, homiletics online, there's a sharing going on about the road that Jesus came into Jerusalem upon on that day, that first Palm Sunday. And then they're referring to that this is the route that Jesus took when he entered the city on Palm Sunday. To this day, it is still a moving sight. This is a group now of pastors on a bus. Right by the bus were a couple of local men they waited for the tourists like us. Would you like to borrow a donkey to ride down the hill, they asked. Perhaps you would sit upon one and we can take your picture. These were not kind offers by generous new friends. This was the way those men make their living. None of us took, up, took them up on the offer, particularly when we heard it was 50 bucks for the picture and a hundred and a half to borrow the donkey. As somebody notes, Jesus was born in a borrowed place and laid in a borrowed manger. As he traveled, he had no place of his own to spend the night. He rode into the city on a borrowed donkey. He ate his final meal in a borrowed room. He was crucified on a borrowed cross wearing a borrowed crown that Joker stuck upon his head. And when he died, somebody placed his body in a borrowed tomb. Jesus was a borrower. He did not grasp or grab what did not belong to him, but shared what was given to him freely. As the early church pondered the identity and character of Jesus, it declared, Jesus did not count equality with God as something to be clutched, as Paul says to be grasped at or held on to in the letter to the Philippians. Our Lord did not hold on to heaven and throw his weight around. He never forced himself upon anybody. So Jesus emptied himself. He gave himself completely away for the benefit of others. And we are the beneficiaries.